Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Sisterhood Share Club's Denim Day discussion. And what we're going to be discussing today is why you will choose to support sexual assault survivors. And that includes everything, whether it's sexual assault, whether it's domestic violence, we're standing in solidarity with all of the survivors to let them know that love is pouring over them, no matter where they are, across the country, across the world. Our Sisterhood Share Club stands with you. So today, what we're going to uh, do is just have some discussions around, first of all, what Denim Day is and what it means. So for those ladies or anyone out there who is not familiar with Denim Day and why it is so important that whether you're a woman or a man knows what it is and acknowledges it and supporting survivors in any way you can. And Denim Day is a really simple way to do that. We're also going to discuss uh, just some of the life lessons learned that the women may have, some of the things they do maybe for protection, maybe what they tell their friends, maybe what they do in groups, uh, just anything that they're doing differently, whether it's the, when they're in their homes, whether they're uh, when they're out uh, and about socializing, just some of the things that they have learned, life lessons learned that will help them help protect them in different situations. And we know that with any given situation, predators are going to do what predators do, but we want to offer whatever we can to help support survivors and to help prevent these assaults on women. And today I'm here with uh, Sarah and Sarah and I are going to be having a, a discussion about this. And Sarah, I just wanna say thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. So what I'm going to do first, I offer the definition of what Denim Day is. So Denim Day is a campaign on a Wednesday in April in honor of Sexual Assault Awareness Month. On this day, women wear jeans to protest against all the myths about why women and girls are raped and to educate and bring awareness about sexual violence. So what sparked Denim Day? The Denim Day movement was sparked by a ruling of the Italian Supreme Court in 1998 when it overturned a rape conviction because the victim wore tight jeans, arguing because the 18-year-old driving student who was raped by a 45-year-old driving instructor in 1992 wore jeans so tight that the only way to have gotten them off was if she had helped her attacker removed the jeans. So first of all, Sarah, I just want to ask, and just anyone out there, had, had you ever heard of Denim Day prior to this meetup? No. I have to admit, Sarah, I had not heard of Denim Day until I was preparing for my uh, International Women's Day. And I was interviewing women from across the globe. And one of the women were, uh, was from Italy. And so I wanted to get information about Italy before our discussion. And that's when I found this information because it was an Italian Supreme Court. And when I spoke with several women, they weren't familiar with the organization like RAIN or Safe Alliance that's here in Charlotte. So that's why we do this to really make women aware. So whether you're someone that wants to spread the awareness of these organizations or you need help or assistance from these organizations. So, uh, Sarah, I know you indicated that you did educate yourself on Denim Day. Tell me about what you thought about it when you read the information. Um, the fact that the ruling was um, that the act had to have been a consensual, yeah. a consensual act um, really lit a fire in me. Um, just the the audacity to even imply yeah. that she had to have been the one to help get her own jeans off um, or that because she wore clothing that was too tight made her susceptible or a target or that she was um, in a way asking for what happened to her. Mm -hmm. um, it's a story that we hear way too often. And to see a court making that same kind of story, it was, it blew my mind. 
I'm right there with you, Sarah. I mean, it was just devastating. Our Denim Day event, we're asking women across the globe to wear jeans in support of these survivors. What was it about that that made you say, I really want to support this event and I want to really support this effort to bring awareness? Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a huge question. Like, to have that sense of standing together um, and speaking up in a way that is still, it's nonviolent, um, it's completely doable for anybody. I mean, everybody wears something then, you know, it's, a, and it, it's an accessible form of protest. But it's also something that you can do um, not just for for others, you can do for yourself as well. So it's a, a, it's a way to empower not just others, but also yourself. I think um, by participating that it shows others and it shows, you know, courts, um, judicial system, police department, everybody, that we're no longer just sitting here quietly letting these kinds of rulings happen and that we're not going to say something or do anything about it, whether that be through legal systems or through nonviolent protest. I, I love everything that you said, Sarah. Absolutely. I agree 100% because when we stand in solidarity, our voices are amplified. Like you said as well, too often women have been objectified and just because they want to feel sexy and have on their favorite pair of jeans, uh, that that gives someone license to approach them in any way they see fit. And that's just not the case. Women have the right to feel sexy. They have the right to wear whatever they want to wear. And they have the right to be protected and safe in that space. Uh, so I just think that's really important. Tell me about, Sarah, any life lessons that you would have for, for anyone regarding any part of this, whether it's uh, sexual assault with someone you know, or some, some sort of uh, abuse with someone an individual may know, or if you're out and about, what are life lessons learned either that you've learned or that you think would be best practices for women? Oh my. Um, so one of the things I recently um, started doing was if I am going to meet anybody new, um, I thought I was playing it safe by just meeting in public places um, and that that didn't help a, a situation that I got myself into. So what I started doing is meeting in a public place, but having having that person that you feel comfortable as a confidant, um, that you can send a, a name, a phone number, a picture, anything that you have on the person that you're meeting, mm -hmm. send that to somebody that you know who will be there as your backup to check on you, text you, call you, get you out of a bad situation if you need to be. Um, and I also went and... Um, I went and got... My CCW. Um, What's I've a never CCW, felt, Sarah? Tell us about that. It's a concealed carry weapons permit. Um, I've never owned a weapon my entire life. Never touched a, a firearm until I purchased mine. But just the feeling of security and the knowledge that I have the training on it now and that I have it if I need it. Um, 
especially just in my own home for home defense, um, has made a world of difference for me for the the anxiety and the panic that you um, that you can have after having um, a bad situation happen to you. Um, I also installed um, home security system and alarms, but all those do is warn you, mm -hmm. you know, and they may be sending help, but is the help going to get there in time? So that's why the decision to get a firearm and get training in firearms and firearm safety. And I took a class, um, it was a week long class with tactical defense of your firearm. So how to maintain your firearm if you're in a hand to hand combat situation so that your, your firearm is not removed from your person, things like that to help me feel less scared and empowered, able to, um, handle a tough situation if it was ever to come up again. I, I think that's really important what you're talking about because I know a lot of women who historically have not considered a firearm are now more than ever considering having a firearm because like you said, you have your first line of defense and your second line of defense, which may be an alarm system, but then you always want that extra security. And I love that you actually purchased your firearm and then you went through training. Sarah, you mentioned the situation. Did you want to share any more about that situation or just that you've encountered that and, and now these are the steps you've taken, which are fine? Um, well... I was recently divorced um, and started meeting some people through some different online venues. Um, and after having met this person three times in person in public places, um, having my backup person that I sent, you know, the, the name, the phone number, where I'm going to be, picture all of that, I felt comfortable around mm -hmm. this person. So it wasn't until the fourth meeting that I didn't send that, that information to my backup person because I was feeling, you know, disarmed. Like it was nothing alarming anymore. I, I was very comfortable. So it wasn't until that fourth meeting that I ended up um, being raped and I didn't, I didn't respond to it the way that I wish I would have because the, the shame that I felt. And so right now I'm in the process of working with a, a victim advocacy group to find out, you know, what, what avenues do I have at this point? Because Now that I've had some time to think about it, um, that person is still out there. And I have three daughters, I have three teenage daughters. And the more I think about it, like the way that this person was with me, I, I couldn't have been their first one. That they, they met, they strung you along, they got you comfortable, they got you into a situation where you didn't have that safety net because you didn't feel like you needed it anymore. They were very good at what they did. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to decide whether I want to go down a legal Avenue or not. There's a lot uh, to unpack with that, with um, emotionally and mentally, if I'm strong enough to do that yet. Will it get out in my community? I have a job to protect. I have children to protect. So, but then I have the other side of it with um, guilt of if I don't, then I feel responsible for the next one and for the next one and for the next one. Mm -hmm. And 
this man didn't just take that he didn't just take that away from me that that feeling of i can get out and i can date again and i can start living life he took a lot more because i i would not have i would have not have told anybody I would not have said anything. I would have just pushed it down and continued on because of the amount of shame that I was feeling. But I ended up having to go see a doctor about 10 days later because the injuries were so bad that I didn't realize that I needed medical attention. And then... Um, shortly after that, I found out that I had an STD and been clean my whole, my whole life and been married for the last 12 years. So it's the only place it could have came from. So if I don't choose to try and fight and go after this guy, there's so many more women out there that could be hurt and infected. And I don't wish it on anybody. But I just, I'm at a point right now where I don't know if I can catch him. I don't know if I can find him. And I don't know if I'm, if I'm ready, if that makes sense. It, it absolutely does. And Sarah, I just have to say, first of all, I'm so sorry that you had to go through this. And I, I absolutely understand that making a decision to go forward in whichever, whatever your timeline is, it will be your timeline. And I'm, I'm glad that you did decide to go forward and find out what happened with you physically. So at least, you know, sometimes people don't think of the physical ramifications after something like this. It sounds like you've gotten to a point where you do want to prosecute. Or are you still wrestling with that right now? And then it'll just be a matter of, can you find him again? I think it's more a matter of, can I find him? Um, he, he knew what he was doing um, and he was very good at it. So the, the profile came down immediately. The phone number stopped working immediately. Anytime, like anytime we met, it was in a public place, but it was always out like in a parking lot. So in an area where there was no security camera, there was so far away that you couldn't see a license plate on a car, no personal addresses, things like that. So I don't know if his name was real. I don't know if anything that he said to me was, was the truth and it probably wasn't. But there's ways that I didn't consider that the advocacy group was familiar with, you know, and it's sad because they're familiar with it because it happens more than, than you think of with being able to track down certain online profiles and okay. backtrack phones and, and things like that. So, Well, that has to be encouraging. And I'm glad you found you were able to find an advocacy group. Do you feel like that helps for you having someone that you're connected to, like you said, that knows the process and knows how, uh, cunning and sophisticated these individuals are because they've done it before. It was, that was probably one of the worst parts of this whole experience was finding the resources. So first I went to the doctors. They gave me a bunch of pamphlets for people to reach out to. It wasn't until I had gone to the doctors and mind you, this was like 10 days later, it hadn't really hit me that I was raped until I was literally sitting in the exam room. Um, I think I was just in shock, honestly. So I was so raw and torn apart after the doctor's visit that I sat in my car before I even left their, their office and I made those phone calls to those organizations that they gave me. And 
it was one phone tree and one office after another, call this one, call this one, this one. And then it was seven days later, no return phone calls back from three different places. And it was so disheartening and frustrating. And I got to a really dark place feeling like there was no help out there. And I already felt ashamed and responsible for putting myself in a situation like I did. Well, first of all, it sounds and like so, you did everything you could to protect yourself. And again, these individuals are cunning and sophisticated in what they do, and it's not their first time doing it. Yeah. I definitely don't think this was his first. So you finally found so, an, advocacy, an advocacy group that you could connect with in person? Yeah. So it wasn't until... Um, I got nowhere with my local contacts yeah. that I ended up reaching out to rain rain is who ended up getting me in contact and um, actually you can either call them or you can text. There's been a couple of times where I was getting back into that dark place again. Mm -hmm. um, and I have texted and chatted back and forth and they've helped me kind of get over that hurdle until I could get into um, a counselor in my area that they had referred me phone numbers and things to. So, oh, good. so they stuck with you from, until you connected with someone. Yeah. So yeah. rain and the, um, Haven advocacy group is leaps and bounds. What I was hoping for, um, for support. It just took it just took some jumping through hoops to, to get there. And that's, that's the most unfortunate part. I think that you go through something that's traumatic and you're trying to, to find services or even to have, you know, you've reached out to a service. They've talked to you. They'll say, they'll call you back. They'll schedule you some time and then you don't hear from them. So well, Sarah, I'm, I'm so sorry for what you've had to go through here. I am appreciative that you shared your story. And not only that, you offered some really important information and lessons here, more specifically around what you've decided to do going forward, in addition to what you were already doing, because you were doing everything you needed to do. And through this process, you identified other things that you feel would be something that you could also use going forward as well. Not only that, helping people understand that there's organizations out there, but the process needs to be better. And that's why I like connecting with women on this level, because when I started having different events with RAIN, just to bring awareness uh, to women, because I have loved ones who have gone through this, and it just breaks your heart because you feel like you can't do anything. You feel helpless in, in supporting and helping them. So I wanted to try and support and help in any way I could and bring other women along so that whomever's in your circle or your group, you may not know of how to connect with resources, but maybe someone else does. And what I identified, Sarah, which is exactly what you were talking about, is I spoke to women about a certain organization. And in fact, in this case, it was RAIN. And as wonderful as Rain is, they've been out there for over 30 years, but none of these women had ever heard of Rain. Nobody knew. They had never heard of them. And that's why I feel if there's the smallest thing that we can do, whether sharing their information on social media, which is their, their website, sharing what they do, um, you know, sharing it through their social media outlets, that's the least, that, least of what we can do, but it can help so many people. Because like you said, you went to RAIN, which is a national organization, but then they know of the local organizations to connect you with. And so being, mm -hmm. um, being in a position to where you need their assistance or need an advocacy group, you want that process to be as simple as possible because you've already gone through so much. And so mm -hmm. the fact that you braved through it and got to the other side and now you're sharing this information to be able to help and empower other women. I, I just appreciate you so much. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. Thank you.
this is really invaluable information. So how are you doing today, Sarah? Okay today. Yeah, I'm okay today. Um, nighttime is the worst, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, once it starts getting dark, the anxiety kicks off. And uh, I generally don't fall asleep now till three, four o'clock in the morning just because I'm up and I'm listening to every little noise. Mm -hmm. And even though the, the assault didn't happen in my own home and this person does not know where I live, I now live in fear. For me, nighttime is like, yeah, it, nighttime's the worst time because that's when it occurs. So um, I have every light in my house on, you know, at night. And I'm just like, like it's a vigil, you know, trying to stay awake and keep my girls safe. And I think, I hope that at some point I'll get back that, that feeling of safety in my own home but I know it'll take some time. Now with your advocacy group, do they talk through or help you understand ways to get through that? Or do they have any recommendations or is it just like you said, it, it takes time? They gave me some like coping mechanisms for like breathing exercises. I started doing some good meditation last week at night to try and calm, calm my nerves a little bit not sitting in the dark or sitting when it gets dark, sitting with nothing on, no music, no TV, no noise, mm -hmm. listening to every little noise. Started putting on like water sounds and things like that to just kind of, it's soothing, but I can still hear what's mm -hmm. going on around me. And then they set me up with some, um, some counseling. So I started that Mm -hmm. uh, about two weeks ago. So I go twice a week for that. So that seems to be, it's helping, but it also stirs stuff up too. So I'm just so glad that you are connected with someone and hopefully there'll be some sort of program or resources that get you back to a state of comfort and peace. It's challenging because it, it takes so much from you in that moment. And then it's the process of getting it back. And it sounds like you're doing all of the right things. And again, I, I really appreciate these uh, lessons and what you're sharing. I really do believe it's going to be invaluable for someone. Is there anything else that you want to share that you want women to know regarding your life lessons? Um, stuff that I could have done differently would have been like, taking pictures of a license plate, not drinking a drink that was given to me that was already made. Being a little more mindful of, yeah, we're in a public place, but let's meet in the actual public place. And afterwards, I would say, um, if it had happened to me again, to not react in uh, in a way that would hinder moving forward with a, a prosecution if I had felt, you know, I wanted to. What do you think you did that would have um, you that? It sounds like you did everything you could. So... As soon as it happened, I immediately went home and I showered and I showered and I showered and I got rid of clothing. I disinfected my car, um, vacuumed it out, <laughs> I, you know, just I cleaned everything and I, I, I just I had to keep cleaning. So. makes things a little tougher um and had i gone back and look you know hindsight um even if i would have just gone to an emergency room right then without the intention of um 
want to file charges or prosecute or anything just to to have that um, examination done immediately so that left me with the option of having physical evidence later if I chose to go that route. Um, it yeah. would have it would have helped in my fight later. What you did, Sarah, is unfortunately just a natural response, right? It's just a natural response. As tough as it is, like you said, and if you could just think in that moment, which is hard to do, I'm sure, to just preserve that evidence. But that's a tough one. I can imagine that's a tough one. But just sharing that and helping women know the importance of that, again, that's just another very significant nugget that you're offering us today. Well, Sarah, uh, again, um, I'm very sorry for what happened to you, um, what this individual uh, did. And I'm glad that you're connected with an advocacy group and they know how to identify resources that may actually find this individual. Uh, whether it's the dating site or what have you, no matter how much you try to hide things, they may have other resources that can actually find this individual. Because another thing you said that was so important and so key is that his actions and what he did and the way he did them, this wasn't his first time. And so if it's not his first time, there may be something that he's left behind uh, that they will be able to discover because when you do connect with these people and they're connected with law enforcement, they have other resources that we just may not know about and understand. And I'm going to be putting uh, on the screen uh, information regarding some of these uh, advocacy, uh, advocacy groups. I'm very familiar with RAIN and I do want to put RAIN out there. Again, although many women have never heard of RAIN as wonderful as RAIN is. Mm -hmm. So whatever information we have, I'll put out there. Uh, again, I love your life lessons and talking points and information. I will certainly compile that so that I can add that to a recap for women so that this is shared across our uh, social media and other avenues where women can get to it. Again, thank you so much for joining, uh, Sarah, and uh, we support you. We absolutely support you. So big hugs. Uh, to you and know that you're not alone. You're never alone. You are connected. And this is a, you know, a group of women that are just, it's just a wonderful group of women that really are committed to supporting other women in whichever way they can and just feeling connected, even if it's virtual, just feeling connected uh, because I think that's important for women. I know it's important for me. And so I just feel like if, if, if it's a feel good for me, it's a feel good for other women as well. So thank you so much for being here.